Sooner or later, the people in this country are going to realize the government does not give a fuck about them. Government doesn't care about you or your children or your rights or your welfare or your safety. It simply doesn't give a fuck about you. It's interested in its own power. That's the only thing. Keeping it and expanding it wherever possible. Some cringe when they hear the term New World Order, despite all of these prominent people using it. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a New World Order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. The world that maybe some people dreamt of at that conference back in Bournemouth when it looked as if maybe history would end, that liberal democracy would triumph, that free market economics would slowly progress and we'd have a new world order. We are part of a new world order. And as the recently departed Admiral William J. Crow once said, it's long on new and it's short on order. Walter Isaacson wrote a wonderful book about some of the wise men who helped shape the New World Order following the Second World War. As we devise a way forward in Iraq, I urge the international community to embrace its responsibility for creating that New World Order. A New World Order based upon collective action. The transatlantic partnership was never just the foundation of our security. It was the foundation of our way of life. It was forged an experience of the most bitter and anguished kind. Out of it came a new Europe, a new world order, a new consensus as to how life should and could be lived. And just like that, it was gone. It was the, it was a new world order. That's what President George H. Bush said. With few exceptions, the world now stands as one. A year and a half ago, in Germany, I said that our goal was a Europe whole and free. Tonight, Germany is united. Europe has become whole and free. The world can therefore seize this opportunity to fulfill the long-held promise of a new world order. We can find meaning and reward by serving some higher purpose than ourselves. A shining purpose, the illumination of a thousand points of light. This is a world that is likely to be dominated in the near future, and perhaps longer, by the Gulf War and the new world order, which is the buzzword of the moment. So the secret of a new world order, and at this point it's just a slogan, but it does have some historical background in terms that orders have succeeded each other over time. The secret of this is to learn how to use coalitions. George Bush has invoked a new world order without enunciating a new American purpose. The president has still failed to articulate clear goals for our nation's foreign policy in this new age. And that's why I wanted to speak to you today 
about the new world taking shape around us, about the prospects for a new world order now within our reach. In the coming weeks, I'll be talking in some detail about the possibility of a new world order emerging after the Cold War. But today, I want to discuss another aspect of that order. You see, as the Cold War drew to an end, we saw the possibilities of a new order in which nations work together. It refers to new ways of working with other nations to deter aggression and to achieve stability. As old threats recede, new threats emerge. The quest for the new world order is in part a challenge to keep the dangers of disorder at bay. We must build on the successes of Desert Storm to give new shape and momentum to this new world order. Only when this transformation is complete will we be able to take full measure of the opportunities presented by this new and involving world order. The new world order really is a tool for addressing a new world of possibilities. This order gains its mission and shape not just from shared interests, but from shared ideals. After the Gulf War had ended, Bush was so obsessed with the idea of a new world order that he had a series of glocks imprinted with the term that he would give to members of his administration, including Colin Powell, Brent Scowcroft, Dick Cheney, and General Norman Schwarzkopf. Cheney would even approve policy papers regarding the new world order. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney has approved a revised draft of a policy document on the New World Order. The Pentagon is backing off a controversial earlier draft and has abandoned a one superpower strategy. The final document puts more emphasis on international alliances and organizations. This would become an unprecedented time period for people all over the globe to discuss at length what the New World Order meant to them. The New World Order means different things to different people. Uh, but to those who expect to be in control of it, it means the same thing. It means all the world under their control. They believe that somebody must rule. After all, people are too darn dumb to know how to rule themselves. They figure that that's their role. Well, government is good, right? It put an end to war. Well, it could put an end to war because you just only have one dictator. <laughs> Think Adolf Hitler had that in mind. He wanted a world government too, uh, with himself as the master leader. Actually, the idea of global governance in a one world order has been around for centuries, and the term new world order has been used frequently in recent history. In ragged, spasmodic fashion, a new world order is coming into being, but it looks less and less like the world order that Mr. Kissinger had constructed in his own mind. Kissinger's new world order would fall under the radar for some time. However, it saw a vast revival during the first Bush administration. Here is Brent Scowcroft, former vice chairman of Kissinger Associates and former national security advisor under both Ford and Bush Sr. as he discusses the New World Order. Uh, looking at the uh, subtitle this morning, Are We Ready for the New World Order? Uh, gives me something of the shudders, that uh, phrase, New World Order, I'm afraid I'm partly responsible for resurrecting. I find the term New World Order very revolting, and uh, just not only historically, but uh, politically today. I think Harding is absolutely right, and the actions of the administration just after enunciation of the New World Order put the lie to the fact there is any real substance behind what they see as New World Order. The first act of the New World Order was A, to make war, and then B, was to sell arms all over again. Is there a New World Order? Uh, we know certainly that George Bush has uh, copyrighted the term at this point. In the aftermath of this war, though, is it an empty vessel into which uh, something will be poured? Is it the appropriate term to use? Is it going to be a new world order, or will disorder uh, be just as significant in this process as we look ahead? We are very, very skeptical of an international order if we are not sure how the rules will be made, because thus far, the international order has been made with rules that we had no input into and that affect us and even when in the few on the few occasions when the rules will seem to favor us then they get changed a unipolar world a world of one superpower may be quite dangerous for us the new world order under the united nations would mean among other things an end to our god-given rights given us 
and secured by the Constitution. The New World Order, which now has, uh, uh, has been called by some the New World Disorder and, and by uh, some people on the more, of a more liberal persuasion, uh, the taking over of uh, uh, the world by the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission and the UN to uh, put us all in slavery. But what are these organizations? Who founded them? And what are the stated goals of each? Before we begin with the Council on Foreign Relations, let's delve further into history to understand roundtable groups and their origins. Its roots go way, way back in history, and they go back to the formation of a secret society, a secret organization. The bottom line is that you take the roots of that organization and you find out that they created in all of the British dependencies um, what they call roundtable groups. And uh, then around those little roundtable groups, they created front groups. And the purpose of these front groups and roundtable groups was to penetrate into the governments of all of these different uh, countries, to penetrate into the media centers, to penetrate into the educational systems. In other words, to penetrate into the social fabric, the power centers of society, and literally take them over from the inside without anybody being aware that they were controlling influence. The League of Nations was the first attempt at the New World Order, uh, the first attempt at a global government based on the model of collectivism. And it was the uh, brainchild of the elitists, uh, the ancestors of the very people who are still working on this project. They're collectivists, the very wealthy people. They're the ones in this country who dominated the powerful tax-exempt foundations, like the Carnegie Endowment Fund for International Peace, the Rockefeller Funds, the, the uh, Ford Foundation, and groups like that. These people were on record, even way back then, that they had to have a new world government, and they dreamed of that being embodied in the League of Nations. And they were solidly behind it. And that was one of the reasons those people encouraged the United States into World War I, was because of the crisis of World War I, and that would also condition Americans to thinking of making big changes in their system, because we certainly don't want another war like that, do we? It was that fear angle again. And they thought, well, by being in World War I, then we would be a major participant at the table to carve up the world and create a new world government. And that was to be the League of Nations. Now, why is that important? It's important because the avowed purpose of the Council on Foreign Relations is to create a new world order, a global government based on the model of collectivism. And that includes the elimination of the United States as a sovereign nation. That's why it's important. The people running this country are determined to destroy it. The council was heavily criticized during the 1980s for being an organization hell-bent on destroying national sovereignty in favor of a world government. So many of its members hid their association with the organization. Dick Cheney had this to say in response to a question by David Rockefeller, who became the CFR's youngest director in 1949 and was chairman of the board from 1970 to 1985. He remains an honorary chairman to this day. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. Now, you are the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, all right? Yes, sir. You guys toy with, uh, with countries of the world like, uh, like, well, like toys, don't you? You're like the Illuminati, you're the Masons, you control everything, don't you? That's the rap on you guys. So every place, there's questions coming from this documentary. And you don't have to believe everything in the documentary to still have questions come up and you look back and you remember what you saw and what you were told, and now you have questions.